So three mistakes that people make in no contact. And these are examples that, look, you're going to be really tempted to just blow through. You're going to be tempted to think, okay, I get it. I understand. But the truth is no contact is so difficult sometimes. It can be so overwhelming that the mindset that's really natural to kind of come over you is, look, look, if I could just stop from reaching out to them, I'm doing really well. It's almost like if you've ever been in a really difficult diet and you're thinking, all right, I get 20 grams of carbs if I'm doing Atkins. All right, I know I'm doing 25 grams of carbs, but I'm still doing really well. I'm not eating three Snickers and a gallon of ice cream, so I'm going to count that as a win. And you almost think that fate owes it to you, even if you cheat a little, to still get the same results. That mindset is really popular in no contact as well. So some of the things I'm going to tell you, it's going to be really tempting for you to just say, ah, that's, that's not really a major, that's not really a foundational, that's not really as important as I think it should be for me to really concentrate or worry about that. Trust me, what I'm about to tell you are things that I see consistently that people do, that when they don't do these things, it works out more often. When they do these things, when they allow themselves that extra kind of grace, or they rationalize because doing no contact is so difficult, it ends up really sabotaging them. So I promise, I'm not just saying this to, to come up with filler. These are things that, that bothers me because people I care about, people I end up talking to, I actually care what happens to them. I care about if they get that person back or not. So I'm trying to share with you things that I know could really help. So one of the first things, and this might sound common, but please just hear me out on these. Friends and family. I've seen this happen so many times where the person is, is doing really well. They might be in no contact for like 60 days or even 90 days sometimes. But there's always this subtle friend or this, this common friend or some way that they'll leak it out that they're really still trying, that they're really still hoping. Say somebody broke up with Tom, right? And Tom's been doing no contact really well. And by the way, I'm not actually talking about a Tom. But let's just say Tom's been doing really well. But then his friends know that it's been a struggle. They know that Tom still wants to get back together with, I don't know, let's call her Cindy, right? But Cindy hasn't been reaching out, and they see how hard it's been. So maybe uh, if you're Tom, you have a couple of friends that reach out to Cindy on your behalf because they believe that Tom and Cindy belong together. And they know how hard it's been on you, even though you've been doing it and you've been carrying it very well. So your friends reach out to Cindy, and they say things like, and this is from a real life, this is from a real life case, a real life client that I have. This guy was doing no contact and he was doing it really well. But then his ex went out with a friend and the friend said, hey, I know he's really been thinking about you. Well, I haven't heard from him. I know you haven't heard from him, but he talks about you all the time. He misses you like crazy. I still think the two of you would be really happy together. And I know he's hoping for the same thing. And it sabotaged the whole thing. Because before that, that girl was actually talking about how much she missed him, how much she was second guessing it. But she got reassured from the friend. So you don't want your friends and family to know that you're hurting and to have that, uh, that Walt Disney happily ever after mindset because it's, it's human nature. We want to do something meaningful. So with the best of intentions, good friends and family will step in. A lot of times it also happens with church. They used to go to a common church. So first it was the pastor, then it was the, uh, then it was the church um, therapist, and then it was the church fill-in pastor. All these people kept stepping forward, and I'm not dogging people that have the best of intentions and that are really trying to do good things, but they're, they're, a lot of times your friends and family will sabotage no contact for you, and because it, it's taking everything you have just to do no contact, there's a part of you that wants them to try. In the situation I'm just talking about, that person said, well, you know, the, the backup pastor, the fill-in pastor said that he was willing to reach out to her on my behalf just to kind of get her pulse and see what she's thinking. Like, don't. You're trying to project strength. Logic and fear will tell you you need to woo them back. Logic and fear will tell you that you need to kind of take the embers that you have left and carefully nurture those with warmth and with understanding and with compromising and doing what you can and then doing more than you can and not just doing the reasonable things but doing the unreasonable things and it essentially reaffirming to that other person that they haven't lost you. You can't do that. They have to have a sense that you're strong enough to move on. So these people will sabotage it for you. Don't let them do it. A lot of times we don't tell the people closest to us the thing that we want to get out. The message that you want to get out in no contact is, yes, it hurt. No, I didn't want this. I wouldn't have chosen it. It's not something that, that I wanted, this breakup. But, and this is an important thing, after that but, it's this sense of respect, of resilience, of self-worth that you have to project. Not just to remind them, but to remind yourself. 
So yeah, tell even your friends and family, look, I didn't want the breakup. I didn't choose it. This isn't something that I wanted. Yes, it hurts. It hurts overwhelmingly sometimes. But at the end of the day, I don't want to be with somebody who isn't excited to be with me, who isn't certain they want to be with me. And as much as it hurts now, I'm glad they were honest with me because this gives me the chance to find the right person for me and I'm sure they'll find the right person for them. As painful as that is, as scary as it might be to say, say it. Say it out loud. Say it to your friends. Say it to their friends. When you hear yourself say it, it actually gives you a sense of strength. Part of the, part of the time when you say something like that, your own mind will hear your own voice claiming that strength. A lot of times your brain will believe you if you say it. But more importantly, it's projecting the strength that they need to be able to see to have a real sense of loss. You can't miss and you can't want something back that has never gone anywhere. So you have to protect yourself with friends and family. The second thing, and I know, look, it's going to be really easy to skip over this. Please don't, because this is probably the number two thing that I see sabotage people when they're trying to do no contact, and that's social media stalking. Everybody does it. Everybody's embarrassed about it, and everybody thinks they're the only one doing it to the level that they are. The more intelligent you are, the more successful you'll be at coming up with really inventive ways to keep an eye on the other person. But keep this in mind. You might think you're projecting strength and they don't know just how, just what the links you're going to, to spy on them. And spy sounds diabolical. I don't mean it that way. But you might know that they don't know the links that you've gone to, to keep an eye on them and to try to find out what they're doing and who they're dating and if they're sad or if they're happy watching the, uh, watching the Spotify playlist um, checking their Venmo account to see who they're paying, to see who they're interacting with. There are these little creative ways to peek in. But what you don't realize what you're doing, even if they never find out that that's what you did, it's impacting you regardless, even if you think it's not. And some of the most intelligent, exceptional, and I mean really gifted people that I know, because they're so gifted, that intensity that allowed them to become so successful, that makes them exceptional, that intensity gets harnessed and hyper-focused onto that person that they lost. And it actually sabotages them. Try to look at it this way. Emotionally, what you're doing to yourself is like, let's say that, um, let's say you fell and broke your hip and you were going through therapy, right? Your, your therapy is designed to make you stronger, to make you, more, make you more functional. And in a lot of ways, to make you strong enough to be attractive, to be independent. Well, the emotional version, when somebody hyper fixates on social media and spends all their time trying to deduce and pull in every little bit of information they can to make sure they have the best strategy, what they're actually doing is refusing to be in, in an emotional therapy, emotional strength training. And it happens a lot. Sometimes some of the most gifted, intelligent, attractive, and really stand above the rest of the crowd type of people get so hyper fixated on pulling in information and data, trying to form the best plan that they end up really sabotaging themselves. Because when that person does come back, because maybe you're doing no contact effectively on the outside, and they don't know how much you're spying on them. They don't know how much you're devoting your time, energy, money, and attention to winning them back. So you think you're still doing no contact the right way. But because you haven't actually devoted that time to reminding yourself just how rare, how exceptional, and, and how valuable you are without them, when they come back, that relief of anxiety is so great. And the paranoia of losing them again is so high. All of that comes together to like this perfect emotional storm on the inside and you can tell yourself all day that you're going to be prepared to project strength and to not rush back too quickly but if you haven't spent that time refusing to look at their social media forcing yourself to put your focus somewhere else forcing yourself to put your focus on becoming the better you I always say find a passion a purpose or a plan that not only projects strength to the person that broke up with you but more importantly reminds you of how gifted you are reminds you of your own worth if you don't do that yeah you might still get the benefit of drawing them back but because you haven't actually engaged in reminding yourself that you are a valuable catch you are somebody worthy of excitement to be with then by the time they come back it's just too hard to maintain that emotional illusion for very long they will pick up on the fact that you're not prepared to move on without them they will pick up on the fact that it was in a sense an emotional act they'll be able to realize that you actually have been hoping planning and wishing on a star that you might get another chance. And a lot of times that lack of attraction kicks back in. So please don't tell yourself that not watching them or watching them doesn't really matter. It does. I promise. The third thing, repeated contact in no contact. What I mean is, and look, there's a lot of videos on no contact. And one of the more confusing questions that you get as a relationship coach is, 
But when they reach out, should I respond? Well, yeah, of course you should respond if they reach out. That's the general answer, right? It makes sense. Doing no contact, the whole point of it is to let them feel the sense of loss until they reach out to you. So when they reach out to you, as a rule, of course you want to respond. But there is a caveat to that. Let's say you've done no contact. And, and I'm, I'm dealing with somebody right now that's in the middle of this. And during the breakup, even in the middle and the process of a divorce, the ex keeps reaching out. And they're reaching out to get emotional reassurance from the person that they're breaking up with, to get an emotional reassurance from the person they're divorcing. Now, as crazy as that sounds, it's a, it's a pretty natural, instinctive thing to, thing to do when you get in this kind of a situation. So if you've been in no contact for a while, and the breakups lasted maybe months at this point, but the reason no contact keeps getting extended is because they keep reaching out. And you don't want to ignore them. You know that's one of the things they're not supposed to do, so you don't ignore them. But if this person has kept coming back and just gets close enough to get you to respond so that they get the reassurance that you're still there and then pulling back, the way to pull them back with more strength, the way to pull them back with more intensity is you have to adjust how much reassurance you're giving them. So maybe they reach out to you every, I don't know, every two weeks. Hey, just thinking about you. Or maybe they'll send you like a flirty response that reminds you of a special date or a special thing. Hey, hope your mom's doing well. Hey, tell the dog I said hi. Look, if they've been doing that repeatedly and you've been following the don't ignore them rule because you don't want to push them further away and it's a good rule. But if you've been in, if you've had no contact broken time and time and time again and they keep coming back just to get close enough to get an emotional reassurance that you're still there, stop letting them use you for a safety net. What they're really doing is trying to use you, I've said this before, as emotional training wheels. They're trying to use the fact that they know emotionally you're still available to give them a strength emotionally that, okay, it's okay. If I am making the wrong mistake, if I am making the wrong choice, if I regret this mistake, then hey, I can still tell that they're there. But the problem is too many people look at not spying and not becoming hyper fixated or focused on their ex while they're in no contact. They look at that as kind of a supplemental thing, like a recommendation. It's not a recommendation. It's an essential part of it. Because look, when you're trying to draw somebody back, when you're trying to get another chance with somebody, making them your world, making them your focus is not actually attractive. And during a breakup, it's so painful. And you'll know if this applies to you. If you're in one of those really painful breakups, then it's rattled you. It's rattled your sense of self-worth. It's rattled your sense of importance, your sense of value. So it's an important thing to do, not just because it prevents you from snapping back and going into that whiplash or buyer's remorse too quickly once they come back. It's important because it's giving you an authentic, a real, a very tangible sense of your own worth. That's that's irreplaceable. Like you might be good at kind of pretending to be strong and pretending to be resilient without them, but nothing can replace that authentic sense of, I know who I am now. And I remember how much it hurt. And I remember how much I fought for this relationship. But the truth is, I know my worth. I know my value. And now that I've taken this time during no contact to reattract them, I've successfully reattracted myself to myself. When you're doing no contact the right way, you're reminding two people of just how valuable you are. If while you're doing no contact, you don't feel like you're, remi you're remembering your real value, if you don't feel like you're, you're starting to have more respect for yourself, more admiration for yourself, then truthfully, you're probably doing no contact wrong and you're probably too hyper fixated on them and that will come back and bite you. So it's not just a, it's not an add on. It's not just a, an extra recommendation. It's a very real part of no contact that gets left out because no contact just as a principle a lot of times works. But the reason it doesn't work is because you're sabotaging yourself if you allow yourself to stay hyper fixated on that person. And really closely connected to that, I'm going to throw in a fourth thing. And it's this strange contradiction that I know a lot of people are going to understand. Some people won't, but a lot of people will. And it's this idea that sometimes we don't want to get over them. We don't want to let go of even the overwhelming sense of pain. Because in a lot of ways, that pain, that sense of ache, hurt, even desperation to get them back feels like the last rope connecting us to the person we love. Part of us gets afraid that, look, if we become strong enough to live without them and not just fake it, not just pretend to know my value, but actually remember my value enough to realize that I don't need to be with them. What if I choose to be with somebody else? And I don't want to choose to be with somebody else. In essence, I don't want to let go of the fear because if I let go of the fear, I might be strong enough to move on. And if I move on, I won't end up with them. As weird as it sounds, it's like this... This contradiction. It's almost like saying, um, I'm glad I hate broccoli. Why? Well, because if I didn't hate broccoli, I'd eat broccoli more and I hate broccoli. 
it's the same thing. I, I know how much it hurts, but I don't want to let go of the hurt. Why? If I let go of the hurt, what if I meet somebody else? What if I not only project the strength of no contact, what if I actually remember my own value and decide to let them go? Well, if I decide to let them go, I won't end up with them. And I desperately want to end up with them. As contradicting and as confusing as that might sound, it's a very real and sometimes a really powerful compulsion. So I just want to reassure everybody, don't give in to that fear. You're not lessening your chances by developing the real strength and even coming to the conclusion that if you have to live without them, you can. If you need to find somebody else that you'll be just as happy with, you can. As scary as that thought can be, it doesn't actually lessen your chances of winning them back. The truth is, if you're strong enough to even consider that, if you're strong enough to see them as a potential or a possibility instead of an absolute must, that actually increases your chance of winning them back. Because the truth is, we're more attracted to somebody who sees us as somebody they very much want to be with, way more than we're attracted to somebody who feels like they need to be with us. As, as contrary as it is to some people and, and some psychopaths, sociopaths, and high-value narcissism, really being worshipped and feeling like the other person has us at the center of their universe, that we are the driving central purpose of their life, isn't actually attractive. We've become convinced it is. We've become convinced that the love of our life should be the purpose of our life, but that's not the case. And we're not actually wired to be attracted to people who feel that way. So a lot of these things seem subtle, but I promise you they make a difference. I'm making this video because I consistently see them making a difference with the clients that I work with. I do work with this, so if you're going through a painful breakup, you can schedule an appointment with me for one-on-one -on -one coaching at dotheylovemecom Let me know if I can help and leave some, some comments and questions below, and I'll come back with a new video soon. So thanks a lot, and hang in there. Stay strong, and remember you are strong.